I'll start in a second. We're just waiting for a few, some more people to join us. There's still people joining, so give it another few seconds. Okay. Um, and I'll start by welcoming everybody to this webinar, uh, looking at how to create short form content. Um, my name's Linda Coburn, and I'm the moderator today, today on behalf of the space. Um, I'm going to start with a very quick overview of some of the practical things to think about how we work together this morning. Um, we have a live captioner with us today, Laura, and um, if you would like to use the live captions, your options are either to go to the uh, captioning button at the bottom of your screen, or we're also going to put a stream text link into chat and you could choose to follow that if you prefer. Um, we use the chat function a lot in the webinars, um, both for putting questions to the panellists, which I'll then uh, share with them at the ends of their sessions, or also it's a really helpful way of you communicating with each other. So panellists with the people, the attendees and attendees with each other, because a lot of the questions that we were asked in advance are things like, um, you know, what, what should I put all my content up at once? What's the best platform for the best audience? Some quite general questions to which I know there is no perfect answer. But one of the things that's really brilliant on these webinars is where um, the audience share their experience and ideas with each other. So that's a, a brilliant way of doing that. Um, and the third thing to say is that the session will be recorded and the uh, captured recording available on our the Space Arts YouTube channel for a fixed period of time after today. Um, and really just to give you an overview of what we're going to speak about, you know, you, you can see it here, but we've got really excellent speakers today, four great speakers. So Rob Lindsay, our head of um, audiences, will be giving the overview. Then we'll hear from Laura Horton, who is the Plymouth uh, Laureate of Words and who has, is just launching her project Theatre Stories, and Robin, Robin Kosozi, who is the Head of Public Engagement at the Migration Museum, speaking about Heart of the Nation, one of their fantastic exhibitions. And then after the break, so just a five minute break to uh, give us all a breathing space, Amrit Singh, who is a space associate and also the creative director of Rebel Creatives and a, an expert mentor and content creator, talking about really using video for short form content and all the way through lots of opportunities to ask lots of different questions of our panelists. So I very much hope that you enjoy our session. Um, and as uh, the, the schedule says, are we going to start with by hearing from Rob Lindsay, our head of audiences? So I'm going to ask Rob to appear now. Hi, Linda. Hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much, Linda. That's great. Um, yeah, I just wanted to have a little chat at the top of today, just to have a little chat about um, yeah, what we mean by short form. I think that we can sometimes inherit definitions of short form from other places. So we might be told that it's video under three minutes or less than 15 minutes or something based on TV schedules. We might be told that it's a piece of audio three and a half minutes long, four minutes long, five minutes long, based on radio. Um, I would like to challenge some of those definitions and just encourage you to think really more broadly than that. And this will play out in the examples that you're, you're going to hear about today as well, because um, I think the things that make short forms so effective are the fact that they are small pieces of content that can go out into the world and tell your story in a thousand chapters or they can tell your story with a thousand illustrations they are sustainable they are um something that you can keep building upon that you can keep building up that you can yeah it, it's that sustainability is the important part um equally for your audience it's something that is snackable that is reliable that is frequent that is potentially habit forming for them as well something that really gives you visibility um, and the thing that I want to stress is that short form doesn't mean that it's media. It's not necessarily the, the amount of time that a piece of media takes to play. It's not necessarily hit play and then three minutes later it's over. It could be a piece of writing that takes three minutes to read. It could be a gallery that takes 
four minutes to look through with captions and, and shares and favourites and whatever it might be. Um, we've seen brilliant, brilliant examples over the past 12 months of people being really, really inventive in, in, you know, in particular sectors as well. I'm still a very big fan of Barnsley Museum, who are doing wonderful, wonderful things with their Twitter account, including online jigsaw puzzles or the Tower of London's Twitter based choose your own adventure. I've spoken about a lot as well. Um, these aren't videos. These aren't pieces of audio. It's, it's not just that as well. It can be writing. It can be images, it, it can be, again, the things that you're already doing. So please don't hear the word short form and think we've got to learn how to edit audio or video or pick up cameras and things like that. Equally, I would say one of the real benefits and one of the defining characteristics of short form is the simplicity with which something can be shared by your audience. I think that's just as important as the format itself. The platforms that your short form is going to go on to hopefully have that share function, they have that comment function, they have something that means that if one of your audience members has seen something and loved it, it can go somewhere else and have a life elsewhere. And again, keeping things snackable, lean, self-contained um, is, is hugely, hugely important. They're really in service of the story that you're telling overall. So it was just to say that, it was just a challenge, as I say, in case there had been any assumptions on anyone's part that we were here to talk about, um, video that we were here to talk about audio, I would say really do recognize the, the support of um, or, or, or the benefit of other types of media um, that you may well already be doing as well. Do think of them as short form as well. Um, that's all I want to say really, that's largely it. I think I think I've come in a little bit under, so I apologize to Linda, but um, as I say, yeah, I, you're gonna hear some really, really fantastic examples you're going to hear really, really good examples of different types of content used in different ways, how it can be versioned from one medium to another as well. So, yeah, that's all I would say is, is really don't go into this thinking there is a certain type of thing that counts as short form. It often is about the audience experience um, and how, how snackable or accessible something is. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, can I just ask you a very general question, which is, Please. you know, we ask people for their questions in advance. And quite a lot of those questions were um, a version of what platform should I use to get the most, um, the, the biggest audience? And I just want you to respond to that before we go any further. Yeah, it's a, it's a great, great question. Um, what I would say is the, um, and this is gonna sound like I'm ducking the question, but I, I promise there'll be more than what I'm about to say. Um, it, it depends on which is the platform that's right for you. It depends on which is the platform that's right for the, the medium that you're using. What I would stress is it's much, much better to find one platform and to really effectively build a community, particularly if your resources are squeezed. It's really better to try and focus than try and spread yourself too thin. Um, spreading yourself thinner is likely to mean that it's, it's, the work is less sustainable for you. It's more stressful for you. Um, it also means that you're going to have less time to spend in that community. You know, if you've successfully built up communities on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, you know, all these different places, your, your time is now being divided. So I would say, you know, find the ones that, that work for you, that you can devote some time to, that you can devote some focus to. And again, that's sustainability. You know, if it's taking you six weeks to produce a piece of content, there's going to be big lags in between. So Go for the place where where you know you can keep people's interest once you've got it you know that sort of thing does that sound okay yeah i think i suppose the point is that we know there's not a perfect answer to those questions yeah, that's exactly it that's exactly it i mean as i say it, it's it's gonna the platform is going to depend on um the bits that you're comfortable with it's going to depend on your medium it's going to depend on your audience as well i mean let's not let's not step away from that as well. I think a lot of people assume that if you're doing things online with short form, if you're doing things with social media, you're necessarily talking to younger people. That's not always the case. Um, equally, if you are putting out, and, and I can see a few people have just, have just asked here as well um, about specifics. Um, I think do consider the shareable, you know, the shareability mechanic, the share mechanic. Um, don't just say, well, we've made video and therefore it goes on YouTube or Vimeo. Those things can live in other places. Don't just think because we've made audio, it has to go on a podcast platform or it has to go on 
SoundCloud or Spotify or something like that. You know, have a real think about how things can live in, in other places on other platforms. Um, I would also say if there are any of you that are smaller teams or even freelancers or independent artists yourself, um, do recognise that your own personal preferences will play a part as well. You will find the platforms where it feels like there is already a genuine sense of community and the people that you want to talk to. So, yeah, do um, do uh, acknowledge that as well. Yeah. Um, and just before we um, invite Laura and Robin to join, I wonder if you would say so, uh, just a short, briefly, why the space think this is important? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say particularly even in the past 12 months, we've seen this as well. Um, this can be this can be your visibility with your audiences. You know, this is how um, irrespective of large events in the calendar, big tentpole pieces of activity. This is the way of maintaining your presence in people's media habits. It's also potentially the easiest way of turning your existing audience into your ambassadors, into your champions as well. You know, if you're putting out things that are really fantastic, contextualizing self-contained pieces of short form content, each of which works as a fantastic first impression. That means if you shared something with me, I've said that's brilliant. and I've shared it with all my friends who maybe don't have the existing relationship with you that I might do, then all of a sudden that's acted as a calling card. You know, it's acted as a, again, a, a sort of ambassadorial piece as well. So it's it's not just hugely important for maintaining the interest and the attention of your audience. It can be a fantastic, fantastic way of reaching new people and bringing them in a little trail of breadcrumbs as well. Trail of breadcrumbs. Brilliant. OK, thank you very much. So now we're going to we hear from Laura and from Robin. So there's sort of two really specific examples of where they have um, really thought about their, their short forms of content, how it's going to help their audiences. So hello, Robin, and hello, Laura. Um, we're very, very pleased that you can join us. And we, I'm going to start by asking you to give us a bit of an overview of your particular project, and then we'll get into the, the specifics of how you've been using uh, short form content to really enhance and bring them to life. Um, I'm going to start with Laura. So you're um, you're about to launch, aren't you? Theatre Stories. Can you give us a really short background to, to what the project is about? And then you're going to show us some of your content. Yeah, so I started Theatre Stories last year. It was really in response to the redundancy news from Theatre Royal Plymouth. And as a long-standing PR and a newish playwright, I was just really devastated by it. So I wanted to find examples of sort of evidencing how impactful theatre is. And as a PR, I was also seeing trends of like, you know, celebrities and high profile theatre makers that get asked about the impact of theatre, not normal people who are engaged in it. So I wanted to find the stories of these community members. So I just initially put a call out on uh, Twitter, actually, Twitter and Instagram. Um, just asking for people to send their stories and I received an enormous amount um, and as a PR I was able to share them in the press um, and also online and it just seemed to really resonate with people so I decided that I would kind of launch it as a project so a year later we're, we're launching finally on Monday. Okay and so do you want to show us some of the content, some of the stories yeah. that you, you've got, examples, one example of one of the stories that um, you've collected, do you want to set the story up and then? Yeah, sorry. Um, so, that's, right. uh, that's not the piece I want. Um, so this first one was, um, I've been basically running workshops with community members um, on Zoom. And it, I mean, it really depends on the participants. Some people want to speak in person. Uh, some people want to do it on the phone. Some people wanted to send their stories. This is an example of, um, I'm so sorry, it's not coming up on my... So this is the first one. This is an Instagram story. Someone sent me a little quote. Um, so on Instagram, we'll be sharing this and then kind of sharing the wider story in the, in the captioning, the same on Facebook. On Twitter, it will be more of a call to action. Okay. And then, sorry. Don't, don't, don't worry. Um, why? This is an audio piece uh, which was collected through the Theatre of Plymouth. Jesus Christ, what can I say? It's, uh, uh, it means everything to me. It's so, totally transformed my life uh, from the step into TR2 and then the journey I've been on and the opportunities they've given me. And I don't know, just believe in me building confidence, things like that. It's completely changed 
me 80% of the person I used to be. So I, I owe them everything, really. Injured. But yeah, it means everything to me, the fear. I feel quite emotional. Lovely. So who, who is that? Can you just tell us a little bit about the person? Yeah, we're anonymizing participants because a lot of them are vulnerable. So this was a man who had been in prison um, and he'd found, he'd sort of come out of prison and been introduced to the theater through uh, the place that he was living. Um, and it just totally transformed him and his confidence. So a lot of the people that I'm speaking to uh, are, are vulnerable adults at the moment. Okay, so, so you've got all these lovely stories, you put them together, you're launching on the 24th, I believe. Yeah, that's right, what, yeah. What, what are you la launching? What, what is it and where, what is the content and where is it going? So we'll be sharing uh, the content across Twitter, Facebook and Instagram um, and also a website that is currently being built and nearly finished. Um, but also as a publicist, I, I'll be running a, a press campaign alongside. So some of the stories I'll be um, kind of opening out. So for example, one of the women that I'm talking to um, was homeless and was able to rehabilitate herself being involved in a theatre company. So I'm also speaking to the big issue. And so they're going to be running a big double page feature so we can use content across the platforms. Okay, so you're already you're sort of you're thinking we're thinking about different platforms and also partnerships. How can you get your stories out more widely? Okay. Yeah, lovely. So that's a really good introduction. And then I'm going to come to Robin and ask about um, Heart of the Nation, and and then we'll get much more into the discussion about how you're using the platforms. So same, really same to you, Robin. And can you tell us about the Migration Museum's Heart of the Nation? Yeah, so just quickly for those of you that kind of aren't familiar with the Migration Museum, um, so we are, uh, we work to kind of show how the movement of people to and from the UK has has shaped us um, and we, our aim is to establish a permanent National Migration Museum and at the moment we're currently based um, in a, a huge retail uh, unit in the heart of a really big shopping centre in South East London. Um, but obviously during the pandemic, we weren't able to kind of do our, our, our physical activities. Um, and so we kind of started to, we've done some work with digital, but we started to kind of explore how, how we might do a bit more. And we were planning to do an exhibition on the NHS at some point, but it just felt super topical to do a digital exhibition um, during, the, during the pandemic. And so the campaign that we've been working on with the space is kind of, I call it kind of the cool younger sister of our digital exhibition. And um, so our digital exhibition is called Heart of the Nation, Migration and the Making of the NHS. Um, and then the social media campaign, we just really wanted the digital exhibition to kind of, to be evolving for people to be able to see stories like theirs and to contribute their stories. Um, so it was important for us that the social media campaign kind of wasn't purely promotional um but kind of there was this symbiotic relationship of kind of exhibition feeds campaign campaign feeds exhibition um which also lets us be super reactive um which is yeah exciting yeah. should i share some what, what we were yeah. Just tell us what you're going to share before you share it yeah sure so so there's kind of three main elements um, to the campaign. So the first are these kind of humans of New York style stories. Um, and what I mean by that is kind of, for those of you that aren't, aren't familiar, um, a, a photograph, usually or a series of photographs. Um, we use pull quotes as well. And then a kind of a first person account of um, someone's experiences. Uh, and then we also been doing kind of infographics, um, which are just little bite sized bits of information um, kind of displayed in colourful formats. And then we've also been doing uh, IG lives. So interviews between exhibition uh, contributors and then working with media and um, medical influencers and personalities to interview them. And then we take and then our. And then we've kind of ended up, the, the campaigns evolved because of the nature of the way that Instagram's changed. Um, so the algorithm changed kind of halfway through the campaign. Um, and as a result, we realized that whilst IG lives were still getting engagement as IGTVs afterwards, actually we needed to develop this kind of a shorter form style of content that was more in line with reels because that's what the algorithm's favored. So what we've done is taken snippets of the IG lives and make them into reels. So what I'll share now is just a reel and then uh, just a couple of examples of the other content. So can we see my screen? Yes. Yep. Great. 
so this is just a reel taken from our first IG Live, which was with uh, ITV's Dr. Amir Khan and Dr. Nita, who features in the exhibition. Oh. In a lift in the hospital. Is that it, true? It, it, <laughs> it is true. At the end of the first week, I was in the lift and I saw this guy and he had a really cool stethoscope. Wow, I love your stethoscope. I would really like one of those because I'm planning on being a paediatric cardiologist. And he thought I was chatting him up because obviously people don't normally speak in the lift. <laughs> and like a few weeks later, he asked me to marry him. So oh, that's my really? story. That is so nice. Oh my God, I love that book. So that was just an example of some of our real content and then just in terms of kind of our other content so this is one of the humans of new york style posts um so we've taken this from from the exhibition um and this is my home and story who was uh well I just, i'm not actually i'm going to say what his story is i hope that you're intrigued enough by seeing this that you visit Heart of the nation uh www.heartofthenation.co.uk and have a look at the the exhibition um, but so as you can see we just use kind of a selection of pictures and then in the caption it's kind of much longer captions um, which at the start of Instagram was like a definite no-go but actually we found that people um, people were enjoying kind of learning a bit more about the subjects um, provided it's not kind of just promotional stuff. and this was another one of Ossie and, and Bimbi um, and then this is an example of kind of the more slightly infographic posts but I wanted to include this one because um, obviously as the we were able, this is kind of an example of how we were able to be super reactive with this campaign because we kind of saw a moment and a part a, a way for our camp to link into what was happening kind of right now. Um, and this was just one of the vaccines introduced and then kind of, um, and also an example of where we, we didn't initially have budget to kind of purchase photos like this because we didn't anticipate it, but actually, it, it made perfect sense to reallocate some budget and then to, to purchase this kind of photo uh, in order to kind of yeah be part of those conversations. So thank you that's brilliant I'm just going to ask you one other question then I'll come back to Laura so just uh, I know that you're talking about it being the, the cool younger sister of of the exhibition but you, when we spoke before you said you know you were really sort of setting out to get a new audience for this and what, what were some of the <laughs> thought processes that went through when you're thinking about what kind of content you would create in order to entice maybe a not, not a more, not the usual museum audience? Yeah, sure. So I think that uh, when we conceived the campaign, uh, uh, which was kind of around October, September time last year, um, it was at a time when museums generally were doing, and, and kind of cultural institutions, were doing loads of Zooms. That there were loads of Zoom panel discussions that were kind of open and split and everybody was pretty Zoomed out. Um, and we kind of felt that, I mean, we're a museum in a shopping centre, so that naturally we're always trying to kind of reach audiences who aren't perhaps muse traditional museums audiences. And we just felt that uh, a kind of non-museums audience isn't going to kind of be signed up to our newsletter, log on, and then sign up to an hour and a half Zoom. So we just needed to kind of take this conversation to where people were, where people were at, and it's much easier to drop in to a kind of a short IG live um, as opposed to having to sign up and commit in advance. Um, so I suppose it kind of came from that point. And then in the end, what we realised was that people aren't really enjoying that long, much longer form content in general, which is where we then have kind of moved on to reels. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, look, Laura, sort of back to you. You know, I, I your kind of key point was about you talked to me a lot about accessibility. So, hearing the stories from people who don't normally get their voices heard, but also reaching out and making your content really accessible. What have been your considerations in doing that? Yeah, I mean, the partnerships that we've made have been really key to that because um, every theatre that we're working with or company that we're working with can help me to safeguard vulnerable participants, but also in terms of um, the, the other companies that we're working with. So we're working with Definitely Theatre to make sure that we have um, we have stories from people who are deaf and disabled and then we're working with Grey Eye who are another disability arts charity so we're making sure in the collection of the stories that we are making them wide ranging and you know across the country but also in the way that we're um we're um putting the assets out there so we're working you know we're, we're captioning everything and using old text and making sure that everyone can consume it in a different way 
Yeah. And what about in terms of like the design of the of the content and the way and the sort of tone of it? Is are you thinking about who you're appealing to and how how that content will work for them? Yeah, I worked closely with Holly um, at the space on that because I have to say. I'm not very digitally minded and actually for me it was really nice to be able to work with other people and to admit where I, I'm not strong. Um, so she sort of helped me to come up with um, different ways, sort of bite-sized scrapbook style uh, work so people can kind of dip in and out when they want to on the different platforms. Yeah. So you, I think there's a lot, that the, the way the two of you are talking, there's a lot really that's quite similar, isn't there, in terms of you know, so really catering to the short term form content, thinking about who you work with to get it out there as yeah. as much as anything else really um and what laura what so you're saying you're not a technical person what skills do you think you had that you talked about bit, bit being a publicist what really helped you to do all of this well i mean yeah it was exactly that like i've been a publicist for 14 years so um i i mean i used social media in the first instance to collect the stories so it kind of made sense to continue along those platforms but i was also finding that a lot of the story collection was coming from older people and that was via um a lot of the time through radio so i've done a lot with radio 4 um, and also local radio. So I'm a regular guest now on BBC Radio Cornwall and we put call outs and then we'll get stories through that way. So it's just sort of, we don't want it to be just young people who are, who are accessing it. So it's just sort of trying to figure out uh, where we're getting content from. I'm also working with primary schools at the moment through the Laureate. So I'm collecting stories through, uh, through the primary schools that I'm working with. So, uh, but I think the, the PR skills are the, are the ones that have stood me in good stead to get this off the ground. So, so you were saying you don't want you, you want uh, stories from a wide range of people, but then your choices of like, for example, using Instagram, you might think, oh, that's aiming at a younger audience. Is how do those things balance up? Well, I guess I mean on Facebook, oh, we weren't going to do Facebook initially, but then a lot of my a lot of my parents' friends wanted to access it and they couldn't through Instagram and Twitter, so that's why we decided to start the Facebook page. And then it'll be all pulled together um, in the website that we're building so people can look at it and decide where they want to look. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess each platform attracts a different audience. And then also alongside that, the press campaign, which is gonna also be reaching different people. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, just got another sort of question and then I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions as well. So back to, to Robin. So what have you learned from what, what would be the big learnings from this um, campaign? Um, I'd say that kind of flexibility is key. Um, I think kind of we're working the pandemic. We when we started out, we'd planned to have all these interviews with exhibition contributors and with kind of medical influencers when we conceived in September, October, we all thought we were kind of coming out of it, right? We we're like, oh, maybe there'll be a winter lockdown, but we didn't expect that we were gonna go into kind of another massive peak. It was really hard working with, working with kind of medical professionals during this time. Understandably, an IG Live isn't their priority. Um, and then also, I think when Reels came out and the algorithm changed on Instagram, we just weren't getting as much traction. So that's when we kind of had to not be afraid of kind of new products and and the, the budget that we had to, to train us to kind of train our team in video editing we needed to focus on a different video editing so not just editing a kind of an interview but also editing with captions um so, can, so, can i get you to go back to that because it's really interesting just yeah. the, the idea that you know you, you the people one of the questions we've been asked is you know how do people keep up with changes and you're talking about flexibility and what you're saying is you're carrying on doing something and then all of a sudden the instagram algorithm just changed on you <laughs> And you've got to be ready for that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think that, it, and that seems super daunting, right? But I think one of the main things that, that I've learned, so I've kind of got a background working in kind of like comm strategy and working with creative agencies. And when you're working with them, when you're starting a campaign, you always start from, from insights, audience insights. So just sometimes people don't know what I mean when I say this. So for example, okay, so let's say if you're trying to reach... Um, so in an agency, if you're trying to reach, say, like parents and children, or if you're, so you're a museum and you're trying to reach this audience with your content for parents and children, you'd start with an insight like the 30 minutes before bedtime is the time when parents are most, parents across all different demographics are most likely to spend with their children. So that's where you want to then target your digital content in order to reach those people in that 30 minutes. 
So I think that if you're always working from insights, then rather than being like you have to be on top of the technology, you just have to be listening to your audience. So we realized that our audience just, they weren't watching IG lives as much anymore. Everybody was so fed up of screen time, it was too much. And then also at the same time, Instagram realized that and that's how it shifted. So I think it's just more being in touch with what people are engaging with and not just doggedly going at something <laughs> when it's perhaps not working. Yeah. Um, or you know it's engagement drop yeah thank you um laura what any, any sort of big learnings for you from the project yeah. and then i think that things don't have to be complicated to be big to be good ideas i think when like growing up and stuff i kind of felt like to do something like this it would have to be some mega complicated thing but actually it's a super simple idea just trying to change public perceptions about who the arts and theatre are for um, and then also just being able to ask for help, you know, in the ways that I, I'm, I'm not technological, I don't, I'm not a marketing person. So I've been able to, to work with a marketing agency to help me uh, with the content and playing to my strengths as a press person. And then also perseverance, because we were turned down five times by Arts Council before we finally got our funding. And I just kept doggedly going. And I think that that, because um, I knew the project was it felt important I think they're the main learning okay thank you so I'm going to ask the audience for questions now I'm just going to have a quick look at what's come and see if there's anything for you and there's also lots of um enthusiasm for your projects and people saying they're lovely they sound like really good projects so there might be a moment for you Laura and Robin if you <coughs> any links just into the chat and I'll have a look and see we've been asked a question about which just I know you're both saying you're not technical people, but are there any particular sort of useful apps or websites or that have helped you to create in the creating the content? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, so. I think the best thing for social media posts is just Canva. Canva's so good um, and it's really easy to use. Um, so I think that since we've got that as a team, that's been great. Um, Square Lovin is a great uh, Instagram analytics um, app, which just makes it so so much easier because it's got a horrible name, Square Lovin. <laughs> I'll put it in the app, in the chat. But um, it's yeah, that's a great app um, for analytics. Um, but other than that, I think it's just about what what works best, what works best for you. Um, and I think also spending a bit to get someone external to train you on Canva, even if it is easier, just rather than having to like battle that out. Um, yeah, worth the effort. Okay, anything anything else? You're, you're nodding away, Laura. Is there anything well, else that you would add? Uh, I mean, I needed it to be as basic as possible. So Holly set it up for me and then she's going to run me through how to do it myself when I eventually okay. need to do it. The thing is, a bit of in external support where you know you don't have all the skills if possible. Okay, let's just see what... Um, Oh yeah, so the, somebody's asking um, a question about uh, w wanting to know what kind of engagement or interaction you've had with your content and did it sort of meet your expectations? So we'll start with, uh, Laura, you, I know you haven't launched yet, but what kinds of engagements and interactions are you getting from the yeah, story? I mean, I, I haven't launched, but when I started the campaign, I put a lot, I, I shared the stories um, on the stage uh, the stage website and what's on stage um, I think they published all 75 stories um, and also I wrote up one of the stories in the Guardian which I shared across um, all the channels and that had an absolutely enormous impact it was read like 40,000 times um, I had so many um, messages from people saying that they wouldn't normally have considered being engaged with theatre but could I help them and I was able to work with different theatres to kind of point them in the right directions to help them get involved in community groups so even though we haven't fully launched yet I know that there's um, like an appetite for it. Lovely and and Robin what kind of engagements have you, have you had for you from the um, from Instagram your Instagram work? Yeah, we've had, I mean, there's kind of the core engagement. One of the things that we did with all of our, with our kind of different IG lives, like each one had a theme and we targeted influencers based on kind of other hooks into the content other than migration. So for example, kind of one of them was on, um, one of them was with kind of a mummy blogger. Um, and so that got kind of got us into a distant and we had her interviewing someone that had a baby, a doctor that had a baby during lockdown and had protested pregnant about the lack of PPE. So then we kind of had a 
a very different kind of engagement because people were hooked in by, oh, well, I had a baby during lockdown too. This sounds interesting. And then came into the content. So I think through the medical influencers, um, sorry, through the influencers generally, we just had a lot of people saying, this is really interesting. I'd not heard of it. So I do feel like we managed to reach new orders. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also had people come forward and say, oh, I'd love to tell my mum's story. I'd love to tell my uncle's story, which is exactly what we we're hoping for. So yeah, we've had, we've had really good engagement. And did you said to me as well that you'd, you'd done a bit of takeovers, hadn't you? Taken over somebody else's Instagram and had the same to you. Yeah, so during this, uh, so for this campaign, we took over the Royal College of Nursing Library's Instagram um, for a day on, I can't, I can't remember when it was, it was in, in the autumn. Um, and that was good. Again, it was just kind of finding kind of captive audiences um, and swapping. One thing I would say about Instagram takeovers is they take quite a lot of effort. So just kind of people think, oh, well, it's just using someone else's account. So I guess that's just always something to factor in. And, and you also said to me that, you know, to really sort of consider that you think because you'd, if you're doing reels, it's so short, it would be less effort than some of the longer pieces. And that's not the reality. Yeah. So I think, and I think this is something actually for that we as organisations and individuals that are doing this work need to be communicating back to funders because I think so often um, there's this idea of, okay, well, an IG live is, say an IG live is like 45 minutes and you've got like 45 minutes worth of content, but a reel is 35 seconds. Um, so one IG live is equal to like, say four reels, but actually we should look at content, not by kind of how long the content is necessarily, but just by the reach, the engagement, how much is getting out there and also by the amount of work that goes into it. Um, and I think that that's something that when new forms of content come out, it's, it's not always appreciated by those who don't make the content, what that kind of, what that difference is. So really, for if you're kind of trying to get something by someone, by a funder and, or by kind of a team and saying, oh, well, this looks really expensive for only the X amount of content, leading with, well, this is the engagement, this is the rate, this is how much, this is kind of how much, how many more people it will reach. Um, and it tends to get people on side. Thank you. I'm going to just check, check whether Rob's around and whether, it, Rob, do you have, is there any kind of question or comment you want to put to, to Laura and Robin? Um, yeah, actually, um, I do. I, I love both of these projects because um, they're, they're both so elegantly pitched and focused, which I really, really like. You know, clearly a lot of decisions have gone in early doors in terms of why you're doing this, you know, what stories you want to tell. Um, but at the same time, it strikes me that both of them still have such a degree of flexibility, they could evolve into something else. You know, they're branded really elegantly with a kind of, this is the, the people that we're talking about. But the nature of those stories or the topics that you explore could completely change. Um, can I ask both of you, is that a conscious decision? Is that something that you've, you've started thinking about how things might you know, what else you could do with these same accounts, what you could do with these projects, or is that just a, or is it just a happy, um, a happy side effect, really? Should we go to Laura first? Yeah, you know, it, it was definitely a conscious decision, and I'm having lots of conversations with the different theatres that we're working with. We we're talking about having um, a stories booth in the foyers of the theatre where people can come and sit and listen to stories, and I'm in conversations with um, theatre, um, uh, publishers to maybe publish some of the stories um, so yeah I, I think there's lots of things that we can do with it and as we move forward and hopefully get more funding then we can kind of we can grow it but at the moment I'm just going to focus on launching. Sure sure. And Robin? Um, yeah I mean I think it was a, yeah I think it was a conscious well it was a conscious decision in so far that I think being the, being the Migration Museum and not having a permanent home, we often don't know where we're going to be in six months, so we always have to be super adaptable. Um, so I guess it's kind of a, something that is in our blood now that even on the, that on the digital campaign, it's the same. Um, but I think that, I mean, the, the digital exhibition which the campaign's based off was kind of conceived, designed and delivered within kind of three and a half months during lockdown. So I think as a result of that, and at every turn, I mean, as, as we've all experienced, the pandemic has kind of taken us to another place. So sure. I think that it was created in this kind of, in this area of pragmatism, nobody knows what's gonna happen. So yeah, I guess it, it kind of, as a result, yeah, it's super flexible. Yeah, love it, love it. Thank you. Um, so, so 
one of the questions that we had in advance was a sort of, I don't really know how to phrase it as a question, but it's an interesting thing to think about, which is the, the, the whether content, you use short form content as marketing or content in itself, you know, where do you, how do you decide what, what its purpose is <laughs> and therefore what you do with it? How do you, I guess that's to Laura really to sort of start with, because you, you know, is it marketing content or is it, does it stand for itself? And does that matter? It really depends on the story. Um, so some of the stories have just been uh, like a little boy sent me like theatre's changed my life, you know, it might be like a line. So I can't do much with that other than kind of have it as a, um, as a quote. Um, but then some of the other stories that I'm getting through are very long. And so they work really well, um, you know, as audio or, or written up for the media. So I, I think for me, it, it's very much based on um, what I'm sent and, and the story collection process. Yeah. And Robin, what about you? Do you think of it as marketing to send people to the exhibition or is it stand on its, on its own, your, con your Instagram content? Um, I think, I mean, I think all content has to do, has to do the work. Like there's no, I think, it's kind of yeah content has to has to do the work and by that I suppose I mean that if the content isn't a good advert for the exhibition then then we wouldn't be putting it out there um whether or not it all has to direct straight to the music to the exhibition I think that it's a balance because people are so aware of being advertised to that that's why influencer content is the most effective type of advertising right now if you look at clothes or like home or lifestyle because people like to feel like it's not an advert. Um, so I think it's it's a bit of both. I mean, the thing about Instagram, which is predominantly where this lives, is that by virtue of not being able to put a URL in in uh, captions, it, ne it never feels too advertising-y because you just always just say link in bio. On Facebook and Twitter, you have to make that decision with the content as to whether you just put the hashtag or whether you put the URL. And it was until recently generally that Facebook posts with a URL in tended to do less well than Facebook post than the same Facebook post, post not with a URL in because people don't want to be directed to it and the algorithm picks up on that. There's a, another question for you, Robin, which is: Do influencers work on Twitter as well as they do on Instagram? Um, difficult question. I think it it completely depends on what you want them to do and on and generally speaking my personal experience has been no because I think it's easier to get people to do things on Twitter so for example when Heart of the Nation launched we had like a huge list of like kind of seeding people that we wanted to make aware of it and I spent a laborious day just adding like hey in case you missed it we just launched this to everybody that might find it interesting if you've got good content it's something that is so worthwhile doing if you've got good content people will either reply to it or they'll share it and say wow I had this amazing exhibition just got shared with me that's free you don't need to pay someone to share it whereas on Instagram it's harder to do that and so you might you probably would need to pay someone or else you have to build that relationship in order for them to do it so I think you can get a lot more for free on Twitter um, because a retweet is so easy on Twitter. It's one click of a button. And if they like it, they'll do it. OK, thank you. And another question is this. I'm sort of firing them at you because because it's obviously you've got some real knowledge in this area. So the, the next one says, is it OK to at people and any tips on working with influencers? On, yeah, on Twitter, definitely just out, out away I be a pest as well. If they keep ignoring you, just keep adding them, because especially if they're someone that both that the majority of your followers aren't going to see because so if you at someone at the start some of you will probably will definitely know this but if you at someone at the start of a of a message only the people who follow both of you will see it so if you're adding someone that probably most people aren't going to follow it's not even going to appear on your feed for most like most people aren't going to see it so it's fine um and what's the second part of the question oh what tips working with influencers mm -hmm. they're way more expensive than you think they would be um so I mean for us it's like we only worked with we kind of said look this is just a gesture what we're paying you but and we work with people who really support the cause and, and liked what we were doing it often you have to contact them three four times um yeah it's yes I'm right yes sorry I should have said that unless you add a dot at the start of the tweet um and if you're pestering people don't add the dot because you don't really want people to see that you're pestering people um <laughs> 
Okay, lovely. Right. Um, so thank you very much. So I just want to come to, to Laura for the, la the last question, which was about, and uh, the question was, how do we generate material that has meaning and encourages wisdom instead of just uh, uh, passing, passing knowledge? Interesting. I, I kind of find it a lot working with companies as a PR because I think a lot of people don't can't pull out like what's a what's an interesting story so I, I feel like it's just really digging into um the stories of everyone that you're working with um having conversations uh being communicative that's always the thing that lets people down I think it's very basic um and then kind of keeping an eye on the press uh what's being talked about what's going on and then you can like quite easily link things to I think we're seeing Theatre stories as a way to provide provocations as well. So if there are conversations in the press about the arts, we can find a story that links to it that that kind of that gives it a bit more narrative. Um, so I think it's just kind of having an awareness about the stories that are happening within your organisations and, and how that kind of links to the wider conversations that are happening. Lovely. Thank you very much. So I think we're going to stop there. So we're going to have a very short break and a bit of a breath. Thank you both very much. That was fantastic. And we'll come back to you. We'll ask you to kind of rejoin us at the end for sort of final comments before we finish up. Brilliant. Thank you. So we'll take five minutes. So um, that will be 11.51. <laughs> so I hope is enough time to grab a cup of tea. And um, I'll, I'll introduce Amrit and where we'll go with the second half. So 11.52 it'll be now when we start again. Thanks.
Okay, so um, we're ready for part two of the webinar. Um, and um, our speaker for the second part, as I said at the beginning, is Amrit Singh, who's the creative director of Rebel Creatives. And um, Amrit's really giving a kind of wider view of thinking about short form content and specifically about using video in short form content. And then, but he's a master of all manner of things. So I think our questions might end up going much wider than that. And I'm just gonna hand over to Amrit and let, and let him talk. Are you, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Thank you very much, Linda. Let me just share my presentation. Okay. Brilliant. Can you get a thumbs up if you can see this? Excellent. Right. What's up, everyone? Welcome to oh, my face is orange with the orange on the screen. How about that? It's like I got a tan. Um, <laughs> we're talking about today short form content creation, focus on the before, during, and after. My name is Amrit Singh. I am an artist, creative director at Rebel Creatives, which is a content creation agency and training provider based in Digbeth. Um, I produce a lot of vibrant ink art and public art sculptures. And my background is in branding, marketing, and advertising with about 15 years of experience. I've been live streaming for about six years. I'm part of Twitter's creative agency and other influencing agencies. And I've been creating content professionally for seven years. Um, areas of content I tend to uh, pr regularly produce are from influencer marketing, branding, um, corporate work to art and behind the scenes to social good. So that's just a bit of an insight into the person speaking to you today. Uh, I am at Mr. Racing everywhere. So feel free to ask me a question on social media or take screenshots, tag me in them. And at the space, that'll be epic. Thank you very much. Okay. So let's start. What is short form video? So with a running length of seconds or minutes, short form videos are a snappy way to create, share and inspire viewers. Kind of like what Rob said earlier, there is no specific uh, time length when it comes to short form, as long as they are snackable. He used the word snackable. I love that word snackable. So I'm going to use the word snackable. Did I mention snackable? Because it's snackable. All right. So several platforms have used um, have got dedicated short form options, which is amazing. So it's really, really important right now. But one thing which is really important to remember is this Vine, rest in peace, made it popular. Snapchat pioneered it. Instagram stories improved it. Twitter made it relevant. Facebook encouraged sharing. TikTok perfected it. And Reels ran with it. The reason why I put that in there is really important. Short form hasn't just come out of the blue in the last year during the pandemic. It's been around for a long time. And it's just different platforms have evolved it, had different terminologies and abbreviations and different ways of creating short form. And that's exactly what's going to happen going forward. This is constantly going to be ripped apart, changed. So don't worry about trying to understand it. Mainly focus on how and what you're producing because the platforms will constantly be evolving. But your content is what really makes, makes it work. So that's what short form video is. Now, examples of three examples I want to share with you that are doing fantastic short form content. One, Oreo. Check out the Instagram is brilliant. They are known for their simple creative social media content. And on their Instagram is brilliant because what they tend to do is a lot of, a lot of stop, stop motion animation. And they work with a lot of artists to, um, to create a whole world around Oreo. So please do check out their video i'm gonna there are a bunch of videos in here but i'm gonna skip through them so it's easy for you to see so it doesn't consume a lot of your bandwidth so you can see as i'm skipping through this video this artist is creating a whole world out of the oreo you know and is brilliant so that's definitely one to check out second is burger king now for the 199th anniversary of the national american sign language day um, they created a brand new campaign, which is revolutionary at that time because they had no audio. They focused on captioning and they had sign language throughout the entire thing. So the Burger King mascot signed the entire campaign, which was really, really cool. And for the first time, they changed their logo to match. OK, so this is a really cool example of how you can use different ways of short form, not necessarily with any sound or music, but still reach a completely different audience, an audience that tends to be feel left out. And the third is Slurpee. Slurpee did a really cool campaign across Facebook and Instagram where they 
wanted to sell a product and they linked it with extreme sports. So go-karting, bungee jumping, theme parks, and they just recorded it and they shared, shared it across all the different platforms. And it was hilarious because, um, I mean, what happens when you take Slurpee on a ride? It's obviously going to go everywhere you know exactly like this and people love to see this and they shared it everywhere and all of their bottles were sold during winter so uh, three companies which i recommend having a look okay so what to think about before creating short form content okay so if i want you guys to ask these five questions you might be at the stage where you're creating content or you've been creating content for a while but ask yourselves these questions number one who are your audience you know how old are they and then what are they interested in because that's going to really impact which platform you use are you creating a timely standalone statement piece or an ongoing serialized conversation that unfolds over time one thing which is really popular at the moment is um parts part one part two part three short form video which can which bring the audience back to you constantly really really clever ways of creating content can it thrive in any platform or is it for a specific platform so think about your 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 language which is going to be important here your terminology and also the size and i'm going to mention this talk about this a little bit later on is it better suited uh, to being consumed on desktop and mobile or just one if so why and can it be repackaged, repurposed, and republished in conjunction with your other relevant content efforts or trends? Okay, so ask yourself these five questions before you start anything. Now, another thing which is really important to think about is your equipment. When recording any short form content, equipment is really, really important. The two really main things is lighting and sound. If your sound is, and, and if, especially if someone's speaking and your sound is really poor, they really won't like it. But the main thing is, the lighting if it's grainy and they can't quite see where it is they'll just swipe past okay so think about what kind of equipment are you investing in remember when i first started in content creation and live streaming i used just my device so your most powerful uh, device is the one in your pocket okay but think about if you want to really step it up what can you use think about the equipment that you, you've got around you however don't just wait for the right equipment every time i speak to clients they're constantly always saying to me oh i don't have the right equipment i can't create any content they're making it with excuses, you know. So think about what you have right now, but also ask people around you. Ask your team, do you have a lav mic? Do you have a, a gimbal? Do you have an iPhone? You'll be really pleasantly surprised when you find out people around you actually have some really cool equipment, okay? And really important here, tailor your content for each platform. So this is during, okay? And I say this a lot, don't be the Hootsuite of social media. And Hootsuite is a, basically a platform where you can share your content on loads of other platforms like Buffer, for example. What you don't want to do is share all your content six ways and think that's perfectly fine. You know, you've, you've shared your content, you've put on Hootsuite on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, put your feet up and you're like, done. No. You're going to lose followers by doing that. And that's a really lazy way. Unfortunately, marketers recommend this. Every time a marketer says something, don't listen to them. Because what you're doing, you're basically saying, I don't care about the, the individual hashtags or the length or the language uh, or the audience. I'm going to just share my content and you're going to like it. It doesn't work like that, you know. So each channel has a different demographic intended use. So for the best return on investment for your work, you want to ensure that the channel's usage matches your content and your audience. So with an ever-changing digital landscape, creating a unique and targeted post for each social media channel can be a challenge, but it's well worth the effort, okay? Every platform has its own set of character limits, best time to posts, ideal image sizes, and so on uh, and more. So the best way to get the most engaging on other platforms won't be the same. For example, the best way on, on Instagram definitely won't be the same on Twitter, for example. Um, and sorry, yes, to interrupt you, is there a quick way of finding out what the sort of constraints are for each platform? Or is it just a case of looking through all of their information as robin said the algorithms are changing so much it's very difficult to actually have so for example you could have a look at a slide which will tell you um, the best tips but that's going to be out of date in six months time or three months time so my way is to actually understand and try to have a look do your own research into how each platform is working it's not going to massively change but there are constant changes so i'm just thinking um whoever is in charge of your content just do a bit of research before you before you start your campaign. It's worth it. 
Okay. All right. So what I will do though, I will give you some recommendations. So for example, when it comes to video, um, there are six platforms that are doing very, very well. You got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Byte, and Snapchat. Okay. Now they have a max uh, video length and then they have a recommended. Okay. So I, just because they have a max doesn't mean you need to use a max. Okay. So the recommended are between 15 to 30 seconds. Facebook doesn't like 15 to 30 seconds, even though they are experimenting with it. Anything over three minutes is good. Okay. However, there are three platforms that are doing really, really well that are like leading short form video. And they are Reels, TikTok, and Shorts. Okay. So you've got Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube Shorts. So take a screenshot of this page because uh, it goes through the key features, the type of music, because you've got copyright to think about and some are included. And then you've got which are ideal for. These are the ones I definitely recommend you start taking seriously. Um, these are the ones that I've been taking seriously in the, over the last year, and they're doing fantastic, especially Reels. Reels is brilliant, okay? So what to think about when creating your content. So making the most of what you have, repurpose and reuse. You know, we, it's all about sustainable content here. We want to think about what can we how can we create new content and how can we currently reuse what we already have? So each time you create a video, you produce it with a specific intent and audience in mind. But these can change over time. So this is when repurposing can come in handy. Repurposing content involves adding to or heavily revising your content to add more value. It's a fantastic way to get started and share wins and allows you to reach people that you missed the first time around. I am constantly repurposing my content because I am attracting a new audience every single month. Okay. So do I repurpose my content every single month? No, but every six months, but definitely on a yearly basis, I'm sharing my best content every single time. And this could be either directly or definitely on Twitter, sometimes on an Instagram post, but always on stories across platforms. I'm always repurposing and resharing my content. So think about before you repurpose your content, think about what is the purpose of the content that you're sharing? Always, a, that's always a good question to ask. And you want to audit your existing content. So whenever I'm mentoring clients or I'm working with um, large organizations, I'm like, do a, do a content creation audit and then think about what to reproduce. And now in a content creation audit, just like a social media audit, you're taking a snapshot of where your content is right now and what you have on your hard drives. And then once you do your audit, you split your content into outdated, irrelevant stuff because the last thing you want to do is speak about Brexit in like a year's time. You know, no one's going to like that. Okay, outdated stuff and then talk about stuff which is evergreen content, content that you can constantly share because it's just epic, okay? So think about that, is audit your existing content creation. And then finally, check trends. Check which trends that you can jump on the back of with and that you can really uh, elevate with the content that you've got. A few examples of content that I've produced and, and worked with other brands that I want to show. So for example, we've got three brands here that I worked with, Autopops, Stranger Things, and the Saatchi Gallery. With Autopops, their, their brief was to share their ice lols and, and make it go viral, <laughs> you know? And I, I hate it when brands say make it go viral because that's impossible, you know? You can't make it go viral. So but what you can do is, is try and find clever ways of making it go viral. So what I did with this, everyone knows those ice lol packages, you know, those little um, ice lols. But every, but what I found is every county or city has a different name for them. Tip tops, ice lols, ice poles. Drop in the comment what you call them. Guaranteed, everyone calls them differently, okay? So I found out that people have different names for them, okay? So I did a, a Twitter poll. I said, what do you call them? I mean, that, tw that tweet went viral. People were calling them freezies, ice lols, popsicles, tip tops. And then I utilized that and then created this video. And again, I'm going to skip through it because I don't want to play it. Where I opened up the Autobops I, before, before it was frozen. And then um, I just opened it. And then I, with the track, there was a really trending track at that time, music. I cut it to the beat and I asked that question. All I asked in, in, on TikTok was, what do you call these? 
and that went viral we had thousands of comments people competing with each other and it was brilliant so utilize differences and that can make it work stranger things asked me to um create a character for season two's um um upside down world and so what i did i created a very quick doodle of a character and if you turn it upside down it turns into a character Ooh, crazy but it was just a simple doodle that it's a character both ways and it's an upside down world and that did well the other one was for two to common exhibition they invited me to go to the vip event well, I think it was the last, it's the last time where the Tutankhamun exhibition is going to be coming to um, the UK. So uh, the Saatchi Gallery asked me to do a behind the scenes uh, video. There you go. I'm just looking at a chat right now. Ice Pops. Got so many different uh, names. Amazing. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so what I did, I literally just did a behind the scenes, you know, going into the Saatchi Gallery, going into the press event, recording stuff, green screen, looking at some really cool artifacts, um, drinks. And, uh, and that then they, they shared this across everything on stories on every platform and on TikTok as well. So that did really, really well. Other examples of how you can create short form content is looking at these. Number one, what is trending? So when last year, when it was um, thanking the NHS, there was a mural that was created in the custard factory, which is a big blue heart with the NHS. And I recorded the behind the scenes and shared that and that, that went viral. Um, people love to see how you create stuff. So I do a lot of intricate ink art. So I created this video in the middle with, of the wolf in black and white creating the art. And then all of a sudden, boom, it's in color and I'm adding color and people love to see how you create something. So that did really well. And then traveling, you know, people love to travel um, and do stuff. I can, do you want me to answer questions as I go along or right at the end? Because now I've got the chat option at the end. Uh, well, I'm just I'm just looking at the time, Amrit, and we've got yeah. about another seven minutes. So okay. and then a bit of time for questions at the end. So it's up to you whether you think you can if you can deal with questions as you're going along and stick okay, with cool. the time. That'd be amazing. I'll, I'll answer most questions afterwards, but just um, I just saw how long did it make the Saatchi gather Saatchi reels. So quickly, I recorded uh, three seconds of content throughout the day, and then I pulled it together. The I I um, did it all on my phone. The app that I recommend for everyone, write it down, please. InShot, I N S H O T, fantastic. I literally edited that on my train home from London to Birmingham. Uh, it took me ten minutes, fifteen minutes max. Okay, okay. So um, other ways are cross-platform promotion. You've got Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. Uh, what I recommend is on Instagram and Facebook, you can have longer versions. On TikTok, split them into five parts, which is exactly what I've done here. Uh, and landscape and portrait is really, really important. So this uh, example here is the landscape version. If I play that. It's not playing. That's the landscape version. And then the portrait version is right here. So it's the exact same content, but I've just either cropped it or I've recorded both at the same time in landscape and portrait. So landscape, this is the biggest question I get asked a lot is how do you convert landscape and portrait? You can either have both, um, uh, you can have either two landscapes above one on top of each other to fill a portrait, or you can crop it in. And if it looks good, utilize that, which is what I did here. And this is a screenshot of an Amazon Prime campaign that I did. Um, the last one I want to talk about is collaborative. Collaborative opportunities are amazing. You know, think about how you can work with people. This is a uh, Arts Council England funded project with the British Council, working with seven creators around the world, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Birmingham. Create content. They all create their own content. Um, and it was amazing. I recommend go to collaborartist.com if you can drop that in the chat. Um, that'd be amazing. Um, watch the video, please, because the video is a 10 minute short film and this is a long short form but all the content was recorded by each of the artists from around the world compiled into one brilliant video that's collaborartists.com okay so remember grab the viewer's attention experiment experiment as much as possible think about the cover image a lot of people when they create short form forget that there's an image at the start before someone even watches it. So that cover image really has to attract the viewer. So think about the cover image, play around with your settings. You've got uh, 1080p, 30 frames per second, 24, 60 frames per second, you've got 4K. Um, B-roll footage 
which is your footage that you record mainly with with uh, all your short form content the rule of thumb is if someone says it film it show it you know if someone's saying uh, sprinkle cheese on a pizza show someone sprinkling cheese on a pizza okay make it shareable think about why should someone share this content what are they going to get out of it um that is something i'm constantly asking is is this shareable is why would someone care to share this and i'm constantly asking that question so i'm making it shareable be creative with props experimenting with edit using InShot. um start your video with a bang with the magic you know so for example i sometimes start my video with the end result for a few seconds at the start and people are like whoa that's really cool and then i go into it and enhance your video with music so what's next wait there's more yes um, I know after creating content, it can be time consuming from the scripts, ideas, storyboards, all the footage, prep times and editing, depending on what type of short form video you're doing. Um, but think about really, really important. Number one, engage with your audience. Crucial. Don't ignore your audience, you know, reply to their comments, like their comments, um, highlight their comments, for example. Don't focus on algorithms. Like I said earlier, algorithms are constantly changing. Otherwise, you'll just go insane thinking about how to keep up with them. But enjoy the content that you're producing and learn on the fly. Use the right hashtag. So again, create content relating to each platform. Think about how you can create even further content and evergreen content by turning your video, transcribing it, and turning it into an, either an audio podcast or a blog, for example. Um, convert to stories. Stories is the easiest way of really uh, making your short form content last longer on every platform, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, um, all sorts. Okay. What's up? And you can edit all of them together to make a longer video, which some platforms really like. Uh, and you can continue the conversation on a live stream. So sometimes when I'm doing a, a short form content that is a behind the scenes or a really cool project, I'll do a live stream to talk about that short form video and go into depth about what it means. And the last one is share it with your audience and on your current platforms that do well. Okay. So remember, you currently already have a platform. You already have an audience that you engage with. If you have short form video, then share it on your other platforms, but, may, but speak to your current audience and tell them, I'm dropping a short form video. I'm dropping this video in 24 hours, or now it's, um, uh, it's released on Instagram. Go onto Twitter and say, please share it. Or here's a link, you know, make it easy for people to share it um that's it thank you very much for listening that was a whirlwind stop tour of short form video I hope that you enjoyed it thank you very much brilliant thank you very much um somebody did ask a question as you were going on you, you spoke about kind of being aware of trends yes. and the question was and how, how do you do that how do, how do you keep ahead of, of trends and know what's coming up uh well, that's a good question okay so what Every platform tells you what is trending, okay, but for a different time pe period. So, for example, Twitter will tell you what's trending th either through tailored trends or trends by your city or location on the right column. But those trends change from for a few seconds for a few minutes. Um, so you want to look at that constantly, but also look at what's trending in the news relating to your content. So what I have, I have Google alerts. I have alerts that come to my email based on certain subjects and topics that i really uh, i relate to and i create content google will send me an alert instantly and this is very easy to set up when something is trending in the news and i'm like whoa that's cool that's trending i already have content that i produced a year ago share it use the hashtag done it'll it'll do well tiktok tells you the trends uh, if you're a create if you're on the creator program on tiktok they tell you the trends a week before they release it but even if you're not those trends are available for a week. So they are literally telling you, and I, I see TikTok's trends as a creative brief, an opportunity for you to turn that trend or hashtag in with your own spin uh, and make it work as well. Instagram trends are very, very difficult to uh, understand. I wouldn't bother trying to understand it. I would focus on just sharing it more as a portfolio piece than a trend algorithm, algorithmic piece. So I would just say, yeah. sorry? Uh, what do you mean by that on instagram yeah yeah so instagram has no way of telling you what is trending they have a discover page discover a button that highlights um 
viral content, but there is no, they don't have what Twitter or TikTok do, which saying these are the trends. So why I reckon what most people use Instagram for is more of a portfolio shot window, highlighting content that you've done and engaging with your audience. That's so like I said, to, as, which is kind of what Laura and Robin were doing, wasn't exactly. it? Exactly. Really exactly that content. Yeah. So remember each platform has, remember Twitter was originally created as a news platform to tell you what is trending. It's always been that it's very, very good for trends and TikTok is very similar, but other platforms will be very, very different. I use Instagram mainly as a portfolio piece, just to highlight what I'm creating and engaging with my audience. That's it. Okay. Lovely. So I'm going to ask everybody if they've got, there's been loads of thank you, thank you comments, Amrit, but if you've got any specific questions for Amrit just now, um, put them into chat and otherwise I'm going to go back to some of the ones that we were asked in advance that um, I kind of thought might be good questions to come to you. Um, just about, somebody had asked about um, pre-planning. I mean, a lot of what you're talking about is you've, you're really organised in all of this. How, how much do you schedule and how far in advance? That's a good question. So I do have a content creation strategy that's part of the social media strategy. Um, so there's two sides. Like as a live streamer, I like to make stuff up on the spot. I don't do any, pl I hate planning, you know? So I like to just to turn up. And that, but that's, that was difficult. I had to learn that through live streaming because I was a massive perfe perfectionist. As a recovering perfectionist, um, I um, do like to plan and strategize. And the main thing, and the reason why it's not good to strategize too much is because you, you, you start to be rigid and you have to really go with the flow when it comes to content creation. You know, you really need to understand this is the purpose. This is a brief, let's say from the client. However, how I promote it, how I share it on social media has to be as fluid as possible because it, things can change tomorrow. Okay. So what you don't want to do is plan a month ahead. And when things don't go your way, you think that you failed. You haven't, you just need to learn to adapt. That's all it is. Yeah. That, you're really echoing what Laura and Robin were saying as well, that you just, you know, it's all about being kind of keeping going, isn't it? And trying mm. things out. And yeah. Um, and we've also, so well, uh, any advice, insights we've been asked about Twitch? Mm. Twitch is great. I mean, uh, I use Twitch again uh, to live stream for a while. Again, we're going slightly away from the content creation static uh, videos. We're going into live streaming now, which is a no I'm sure the space will do another program event like this for live stream specifically, but uh, I don't want to confuse people with Twitch on this one. Okay, smashing. Thanks very much for that. Very straight, straight, straightforward. Um, we were also asked... Um, about engagement how do you track engagement and improve what you're doing how tech how tech savvy do you need to be i think to kind of keep across the analytics so the engagement side is actually very easy all you do is if someone replies you if someone comments you reply that's it just think about it on that side so think about and and here's a tip by the way instagram um, determines what is doing well on how many comments it receives in the first 45 minutes. That's a current alg algorithm. So when, and what people make the mistake of is when they, they post something, they don't reply to comments until a day, two days, a week after. So what you want to do though, is when someone comments really within the first hour, reply back to as many as possible, because what that's telling Instagram is, whoa, this piece is actually getting really cool engagement. People are sharing it. Um, they're saving it. So encourage people to save it um, because they are looking. Originally, it was all about likes. And now it's all about how many comments you're getting, how many times it's shared onto stories, and how many times it's saved into their folders. So I would encourage, as a content creator, three things. And you can do this just two stories. Um, start to train your audience. As soon as you drop a new post or new video, get them to drop a comment. But you have to ask an actionable question in your caption first. Number two, get them to share it on stories. Because that's easier to do. That story is gone in 24 hours. So it's not onerous. Number three, get them to save it. Those three things tell Instagram that your video is doing really well and it helps elevate your platform. Then afterwards, just have a look at the analytics. Don't focus too much on the analytics if you're new because it can get quite overwhelming. But I would just say focus on the engagement. That's really the key, key part. 
I'm, I'm really interested. The words you used were train your audience. And I'm, so it's making think that building of the relationship feels like the really a really, really important aspect of all. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, it, training your audience sounds strange, but that is something that you have if like if people this is the reason why uh, setting expectations is really good. If your audience knows that you share a lot of behind the scenes, a really cool content, they're learning something from you, that they that they prefer you to share the content because you're providing it to them exclusively. And you can even do that, by the way, you can share, you can say to your audience, because I really appreciate you guys on Instagram, I'm sharing this content on Instagram first. Then tomorrow I'm sharing it on Twitter and other platforms. So please share it on your stories. And um, if your audience really like what you do, they will, no one likes to see anyone fail. Everyone likes to see someone, everyone do really, really well. So if you ask again, I think Laura mentioned this, don't be afraid to uh, ask. Don't be afraid to ask for help. That is one of the biggest things that you should be doing on social media is asking for help, asking for shares, asking for like, uh, asking for comments, you know, people really will do it. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to ask the others to rejoin us again. So I'm just going to, when, when, when everybody comes back in, I'm going to ask you all for a kind of final tip or sort of pearl of wisdom that you would share with our audience. So um, you, because you are still talking, Amit, I'm going to come to you first. So if there's one other thing you would like to sort of share with the people on this, on this call. Now is um, your my biggest tip I would say is um, take everything that I've said, rip it into pieces, forget about it. And <laughs> no, reapply your own style is really important. You know, there is no blueprint for success here. There's no blueprint to doing really well. Take every, what every single person has said, Robin, Laura, and rip it apart and pull it back together with your own viewpoint, style, authenticity, and honesty. And then that is what will work. Lovely. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and so, and, and I thank you for all of that for the last 20 minutes. It's been great. There's lots of lovely positive contents from the uh, comments from the audience as well. I'm going to come to Laura next. What would your pearl of wisdom be? I think the main one is just trust your instincts. Um, when I haven't done that, I've always uh, not done as well. So I think you just have to follow your gut sometimes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Robin, what would you say? Um, I think, well, yeah, it's, it's been great today, Emma, it's, it's brilliant, it's, um, it's been really interesting hearing both you and Nora. Um, I think I would just say, um, meet, your, meet your audience where you're at, um, so, and, and that also means sometimes we think, oh, well, I want this to go viral, which it made me laugh when Amrit said that, because there's so many people say that, it's like, well, that's not really how it works, can't speak it into existence unfortunately um but so sometimes because it's like oh I want it to go viral I want it to reach so many people so therefore I need to put it on this platform but I've been in my kind of like freelance strategy work I've been working with an organization recently who were they kind of wanted to reach older um Caribbean audiences with the content and actually what they found is like where all the aunties are, are communicating is on whatsapp so what they needed was something shareable on whatsapp so you're not getting the views and the likes and things like that. But I think it's it's just important to just meet people where they're at um, and think about your purpose for that. Lovely. Thank you so much. Um, and Rob, to you, what, what's your sort of, um, I'll ask you for your a, a final piece of advice and also maybe just a bit of a comment on what you've heard today. Oh, I mean, if I had any comment, it would just be, that was an amazing amount of ground covered. And I love how practical and actionable all the, all the, insights were all the examples where I hope that's come across as well again you know it just what I said at the beginning about there will be an approach that is right for you and for your organization your culture your confidence your resource your audience all sorts of things um I really hope that's come across um I would yeah just I'd encourage you to think what happens next we've talked about short form content as being something that um should be shared it should move on it'll have a life outside of you publishing it and someone reading it or listening to it or looking at it or watching it or whatever it might be, um, it can go off and, and do something else to really kind of amplify your message. Um, so have a think about what that is, what, what it is you're trying to achieve with each thing that goes out. Again, I completely echo, avoid seeing these things as individual tentpole pieces of stuff that's gonna go viral and do your entire job for the year in one week. Um, it just doesn't happen. And again, when I say think about what happens next, um, that's the same for you as well. I'd reiterate what everyone said, building time to evaluate, to assess, to evolve, to adapt. 
um, to change if you need to. And be really honest about that as well. If you've put something out and it hasn't achieved what you wanted it to, be honest with yourself and with your team, talk through, learn for next time as well. It's absolutely fine for something not to achieve what you wanted to, as long as you can learn something from that. Again, actionable insight. But I'm, I'm just echoing what everyone's already said, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, everyone. OK, so just to finish up, we have um, when, when you leave the call, we have an evaluation form and um, it really only takes a minute to fill in. And we really appreciate the evaluation really helps us to <clears throat> improve the webinar series as we go along. And also that data is what allows us to pr present these webinars at no cost to, to the audience. So a big plug, please do the evaluation. And also to say that our next webinar is um, scheduled for the, it'll be the 5th of July. Um, and it's um, neurodiverse artists and practitioners speaking about their work and also how to reach neurodiverse audiences. So very different subject matter, but again, fantastic lineup and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so a thank you to everybody for joining us and a massive thanks to our panel for all their um, input and inspiration. Much appreciated. And that's it, final word and goodbye everybody. Thanks everybody. Thanks guys.